Yes, I can go away. Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. Uh, let me just say welcome to church. You know, we believe that God has uh, brought every single one of you here this morning to worship Him and to, uh, and to get into His Word together. We're excited to be able to gather together and to sing praises and to fellowship and to, uh, and, and to, look, and to be in God's words. So let me read you a passage of Scripture. As we begin our worship service this morning, Psalm 50 says this, The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from its, the rising of the sun to its setting, out of Zion, the perfection of his beauty. No, no, God so shines battles. forth. Our God comes, he does not fit silent before him as a devouring fire, and around him is a mighty tempest, and he calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is our judge. So this morning we have an opportunity to come and to sing praises to the king of the world. That there is no king like King Jesus. And that we are excited to be able to come and, and, to, and, to, and to sing of his grace and of his great love. And just to rejoice together this morning. So let me invite you to stand with me as we get ready to worship. And I'm going to pray for us. And we'll worship our Savior. Father, we just come before you this morning, God, and we're grateful for an opportunity we have, Lord, to gather together as your people, God, who have been saved, who have been loved, who have been forgiven by grace. God, to be in this place this morning, God, and to set aside all distractions from this past week, all distractions from the outside, coming up this next week, God, to take this time. God, and to fix our hearts on Jesus Christ. So, God, we're here this morning, and we're desperate for you. God, we ask that you would work this morning, God, that, that through our singing, through this music, God, through your word, the Holy Scripture, God, I pray that you would take whatever we need this morning our hearts, and you would change us. You would grow us. God, that we would leave a little different than we were when we first came in here. God, that we would be amazed by your mercy. We'd be overwhelmed with your grace. Lord, we just give you thanks, give you honor, and we pray that in our worship service this morning, Lord, there would be one name that would be magnified, and it's the name of Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, freedom! Let's worship together.
this out. We believe. We believe. We believe that our God is alive in our hearts. Free. We believe. We believe in King Jesus. He is alive indeed. Come on. We
Let's break. Jesus Christ, you are our hope. You are our only hope for salvation. Lord, thank you. Thank you what you did on the cross. We love you and all of our worship, all of our praise goes to you for you're the only one worthy. Lord, open our hearts so that we can hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. We're excited that you all joined us this morning to worship the Lord together. And of course, we're just thankful. And again, I think that's something that we need to, we need to be reminded of as well as, you know, we had a lot of weeks last year where we were not able to be here and to just continue to be grateful and uh, thank the Lord specifically that we get to be together because we know we need one another. Um, and the church is, it, it's a body and it's about us being together, worshiping together, confessing sin to one another and and that's what we're going to talk about today is confession. Um, but last week, Dustin began a series entitled A Call to Prayer as we, we look at the foundation really largely of the Christian life, and that's prayer. I can remember years ago here, and if you remember Charles Stanley, he said prayer is the lifeblood of the Christian. And so we know we can't live without blood, and I think so our spiritual lives, our relationships with God cannot live and thrive without prayer. And so today we are going to look in a, in a piece of scripture, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, Psalm 51. Um, I, I also that I, in this passage that later I will describe as what I think is possibly one of the most important verses in the Bible for us to understand sin, to understand why we sin, and to understand what we lack. What we lack that causes us to lead us into sin and how to pray about that. And so we're going to look at confession. But I would just ask if you would just join me in a moment of prayer um, real quick. And then we'll get into the text. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would help us this morning. Lord, we've, we've come in here today with different things in our lives. Burdens stresses, pains, ailments, hurts, regrets, shame, and even sin. All of us have come in here today, sinners before you. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to understand your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you would guard us from becoming defensive and forfeiting the healing that you offer us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you and to know that you are good and kind and gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love, slow to anger, full of mercy. Let us know that. And Father, I pray that we would be honest before you, that you would show us what confession is. And that we would perform it. That we would come in honest, broken, desperate hearts before you. That we would confess our sin. That we would confess where we are. And that we would cry out to you for renewal, for restoration, and for transformation in our own hearts. So Lord, we ask you, be honored in this time and to help us by your spirit. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you will, stand with me. We're going to be in the... The book of Psalms, chapter 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in, in, in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. 
Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. A broken and contrite hope, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Before we get to kind of the context of David's prayer here of confession and repentance, I want to at least, just, there's so much here. Well, this is one of the most difficult things that I had this week kind of occurring is just the difficulty of not being able to cover so much that is in here. And I think that's often, I know that's often a struggle of mine. It's often a struggle of Dustin's as there is so much in the Bible when we approach a passage of Scripture that we would like to say or we would like to talk about. And that's even just the parts that God has revealed to us and opened us up and that we have learned ourselves. Who knows the things that we have yet to, to encounter there. And so today, I want to focus on a couple of things. So here's my goal. My goal for us this morning as we cover this is to see what true confession looks like. I think this is vitally important. I think especially for those of us who, who, like me, have grown up in church all our lives. And so we've watched kind of the process. We've seen the motions, you know, and there, there are things that we think. May not be accurate. That may not be true. And because of such, we are missing something. Also, I think it's critically important for us to, to cover this largely as well as because the, the enormous and vast amount of false professions of faith that we see. And we can see that by just looking at the statistics about how many people would say that they're a Christian. And then when you get into specifics, you're like, oh, never, never mind. You're not. Or you may say that about yourself. You're not. Oh, oh, if that's what the Bible teaches, if that's what God is like, then I'm not, I'm not about that. And so we need to see what does true confession mean look like. Secondly, I want us to see that personal, individual, private revival is ground zero for congregational revival. We hear about revival all the time. We pray for revival. We ask the Lord, Lord, just bring revival to our land, bring revival to our church. We want to see people saved. We want to see people just passionate and just their lives transformed. We want to see people who, who walk out of drug addiction. And that are free from that and walking in newness of life. We want to see people who've, who've walked out of a, a, an addiction to pornography and they're now walking in a newness of life. We want to see people who they used to, their life was just, just consumed with money and possessions walking in the newness of life. We desire that, do we not? I hope we do. But I want us today, today to see that ground zero for that to take place is you in your own private, personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts with us individually. And so I want to cover the context first of this, of this passage of Psalm 51. And just to, to kind of cover it briefly, uh, here's what happens. And I've got it kind of in your notes. Do I have it up here? Did I put 2 Samuel 12 on here? Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead. We'll read that. Um, in chapter 11, before we get to verse 12, chapter 12, in chapter 11, what happens is uh, verse 1 of verse 11 says that in the spring of the year, a time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. So the first thing I want to see here, as far as just for us to understand this text, is that David is supposed to go out to battle. This is the time when kings go out with their armies and they go to battle. But for whatever reason, we don't know. We might could make an inference. Could it be that, you know, David had his fair share of battles, and you know what? I paid my dues. I'm just going to sit back, and I'm going to have a little vacation. I'm going to stay home and rest. We know he was supposed to go, but he decided not to go. So he stays home. He goes out onto his roof. He sees a woman from a distance. 
lusts after the woman, has her taken and brought to him, commits adultery with her, she gets pregnant. And so in order to cover it up, David has a whole little thing that he tries to do. He tries to, to get the, her husband to come home and to try and cover it up, make, sure, make it look like it had nothing to do with him. Uh, long story short, husband was a very honorable guy, wouldn't go home while his soldiers were out on the battlefield. So he ends up having her husband killed. Tells the, uh, the other officers, you need to go up, storm the front, put him on the very front lines, and everybody withdraw and let him get killed. And so what happens? And we find out at the end of chapter 11, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Obviously, we probably could, we, we probably could infer that. But it says it here explicitly. The Lord was displeased. And so what, da- what the Lord does is he sends his prophet, Nathan, to David to confront him in his sin. And so chapter 12, we're going to cover that real quick. And this is what it says. And the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of the morsel and drink of his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore... The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. And so David, it seems beginning with a matter of one decision, destroys his entire life. He sins against his God. He sins against a faithful officer in his army. He sins against the nation by betraying him. It's a major mess. And we also see in that passage as well is, is why, while at the end we, are, we can be comforted, and we'll, we'll really get into that further here in a moment, that God puts away his sin which is a foretelling of, of Christ. But God puts away his sin, but at the same time, there were consequences of his sin. The sword shall never leave your house. And if you're not familiar with the story of David, or you continue to read, David had a very tumultuous family life from this point on. Very tumultuous. And so sometimes, even in our own life, while God is good and gracious to forgive and to be merciful to us, sometimes there are consequences that, we will have to endure because of sinful decisions. And so now I want to look at this prayer. God in his good... And here's something... This is so important. God in his goodness and his mercy sends Nathan to confront his sin. Do you know that it is a loving thing for God to confront our sin? 
We in our own flesh like to be defensive and we like to hide just as our, our, our long forgotten parents, Adam and Eve, sewed up fig leaves and hid in a bush from the presence of the Lord. So we like to hide from him. But how kind and gracious and merciful for God to send the prophet. And so David then pins this prayer, this song, this confession to the Lord. And he begins by saying this, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Have mercy on me. Is there any better way that we could approach the God of the universe than with the words, have mercy on me? Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, Jesus says this. He also told the parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. And he tells this parable. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so as, as heinous and wicked and vile the, uh, were the sins of David, David begins his prayer to the Lord, the God, the creator, the merciful king of the universe and says, have mercy on me. Which brings us to our first point this morning. And that is that true confession is humble and desperate. If you've not caught on in the last probably about three months, confession has become a major theme of, of our preaching here, uh, of just recapturing uh, really what it is, is it's an honesty of who we really are, that we are desperate for the Lord. And so here we see David. Obviously, he's in a desperate situation. But his confession is one that is full of an attitude of humility and honesty. True confession is humble and it is desperate. It is not merely being sorry that we were caught. It is not being merely sorry because we feel guilty. In a moment, we're going to see several guys in the Bible who they acknowledge that they sinned. But they never acknowledge that they sinned against God. David continues, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. David begs, he requests that God would wash him, that God would cleanse him, that he would do this on a soul-working level, on a deep, profound, intimate level. He has an urgent desire for forgiveness and transformation. We also see here that, that David has a transparency with God. How often do we approach God and we attempt to fool him? That we attempt to, to put our nice things on, to, 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 put all our, to say the right words, and to come to him thinking that we're honoring him when he knows us. He knows our heart. David is transparent with the God. He says, I know my transgressions and my sin. I know the sins that I have committed. He acknowledges these things. Again, I think this is vitally important for us to understand. Is to be honest and to be real before God who knows all things. To acknowledge our sin for what they are. David's sin Against Bathsheba, he sinned against Uriah. In essence, he sinned against the entire nation by betraying a faithful member, member of the military. But the sins against others were most of all, and this is very important, the sins against others were most of all sins against God. Against you, you only have I sinned. 
When we sin against others, most fundamentally, you and I are sinning against the God of the universe. When we gossip, when we slander, when we lie, when we betray, if we commit adultery, cheat on our taxes, whatever, fill in the blank. Any sins that we commit, ultimately, if they are directed towards others, if we blast off in unrighteous anger and bitterness against a family member, against a co-worker, ultimately, those sins against that person, most importantly, are sins against the Lord. And David understands this. David knows this. Which brings us to point two is that true confession sees sin not merely as an offense to God's law, but an offense to God's heart. It's not just that we break the rules, but that we have broken God's heart. God has given us commandments in the scripture for our own flourishing, for our own joy. God is not a grandpa in the sky. He's not the man upstairs who just wants us to do right. He wants us to know him and to love him and to enjoy him. And if we are not enjoying him, then we cannot glorify him. David sees that his sin is not just offending God's law, but he is hurting and offending God's heart. Many will acknowledge their sin, but few will admit that their, they, that their sin is against God personally. Pharaoh did this in Exodus chapter 9, verse 27. Pharaoh admitted to Moses, I have sinned against the Lord. Or he says, I, sorry, he says, I have sinned. But he does not admit that his sin was against God in a personal way. That he was sinning against this glorious, gracious, and merciful king. If you know the story of Balaam and the donkey, and I might have said that name wrong, uh, in uh, Numbers chapter 22, verse 34, same thing. Long story short, he sins, but he admits his sin is just a general, I have sinned. King Saul did the same thing in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 30. He says, I have sinned, but he does not admit who he has sinned against, most fundamentally. And again, we see this, I think, probably most profoundly, Matthew 27, verse 4, if you all remember the, the disciple Judas who betrayed Jesus. And then at the end of all of it, he admits that he sinned. But he doesn't admit to sinning against God personally. Many will admit, you know what, I'm, just, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes, which is true. But how few will go to God and see that their sin is against Him personally? That's what makes sin so serious. That He's the Lord. That He's our God. That we have committed treason against our Maker. But to contrast this, we also see in, in, in this passage, we see David do this. David si uh, admits to sinning against God personally. But we also see, if you remember, uh, last year, towards the end of the year, we did a little series called Lost and Found on the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, which really, I think I called it the parable of two lost sons, because that's really what it is. And if you remember, when the prodigal decided that he was going to come home, he says, I have sinned against heaven and you. I have sinned against God and you. And then we know the rest of the story. But while he was a long way off, the father ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. We see an exchange of goods, which shows us the exchange of Christ's righteousness for us and our sin. We see that welcoming. We see that restoration. But he understands what his sin truly was. David continues in verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Here David shows us, and I was just talking to somebody about this uh, uh, earlier. We were talking about kids and how we don't have to, you, know, you don't have to train any kids to be selfish. Parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, you all know this, former kids. Kids are naturally, babies are naturally selfish. They say one of their first words, they're mine. They want it all. We don't have to teach them that. Why is that? Well, here we are. We, David shows us 
is that we are born with an inherited sin nature from our parents, Adam and Eve. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. We don't simply sin. We, by our nature, apart from the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, are sinners. And that sinner's doomed for punishment because God is a just and holy God. John 3, 19, of course we know John 3, 16, but a few verses later, Jesus explains that men love the darkness rather than the light. And there it goes even further. As a part of our nature, it's not just that we simply do wrong. It's that we prefer wrong. It's that we enjoy wrong. It's that before Christ comes and rescues us from sin and death, before the Holy Spirit draws us and opens our eyes that we see. And for those of you who are walking with Jesus, you remember. You remember a moment in your life where you, you that probably know what just happened, but everything changed. That you desired God. You desired to love Him and to know Him. You desired to serve Him and to use your life for Him. But naturally, we love the darkness rather than the light. He continues on and says, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. There David continues his prayer, reiterating much of what he began with of an urgent cry that he desired cleansing. Such is a fruit of genuine, true confession, is when we come to God not just wanting, not just wanting to appease our own selves, but that we want to be transformed. We don't want to stay the same. We don't want to continue to do what we don't want to do. Remember, if you remember, Paul described his own spiritual life and his own failures as, I do what I don't want to do, and I can't do what I want to do. That there is this struggle within us, and, the, and we beg and we cry out to the Lord to transform us. And along with that prayer, we seek the transformation. We seek the, the, the part that, that things that we can handle. We seek Him in His Word. We seek Him in prayer. We seek Him in fellowship. We seek Him by confessing our sins to one another and asking for help and strength. We, if we have something in our life that needs to be cut off and tore off to protect us from, from sinning, we cut it off, right? That's the call for us, at least. And so He continues. At, it continues. He cries out for cleansing, for forgiveness. And then He describes His own soul. He describes how breaking God's heart has now broken his. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. He desires renewal and restoration with God. But so important for us to see here is as David is that David presses on is that he requests for God to change him at the deepest possible level. Sometimes we can very easily find ourselves for ourselves when we are seeking to navigate our own spiritual life, but also with others, is that we just want to change outward behavior. That we just want to get people to act right, to do right. But we need more than mere behavioral modification. We need a heart transplant. We need resurrection. Ephesians 2 says that we are dead. If you look over two Psalms uh, past 51, 53, the, the title there is there is none who does good. Nobody. Psalms 14 says that nobody seeks God on our own naturally. We don't. And so we need a miracle. We need a heart transplant. We need renewal. We need the Lord to intervene into our life and to show us who he is. And again, 
think of this as, as a continual effort as well. All of this is happening to somebody who is a follower of Jesus Christ. In, in a sense here, obviously, Jesus was to come, but who is a child of God here. This is a continual effort. This is not only at salvation. This is not only at that moment that, as we talked about, that our life was transformed, we saw our sin, and we confessed it with the Lord, and now we're seeking to honor Him and serve Him with all that we are. This is a continual every single day of our life until Jesus calls us home. And that continual effort and training and war and battle is the fruit of the genuineness of our faith. That's what separates the wheat from the tares. That's what separates who, who's real about this and who's not. Verse 12. And I want to camp out here for a few moments. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Here is what I believe possibly one of the most important verses in all of the Bible. And here's why. Throughout this prayer, so far, we talked about all of David's life, right? We talked about all the sin that he had committed against the Lord. We talked about even, even his unrighteous response. And if you go back and you look and he says, I'm going to have the man, uh, I'm going to have the man pay fourfold. That's even like way more than really what was, what was customary. That was way more than what God had commanded about. If you go back and you look at the laws and the, the, uh, the books of Moses and you see what would be required for somebody who stole, it was way, way more, which is also a major temptation for us is when we sin and don't confess our sin, when we see somebody else do the same thing or even less, our, our response to it is 10 times higher than really what is justified. And so here we see throughout this psalm, David doesn't mention, he doesn't mention anywhere to his lust. He does not mention to his adultery, makes no mention of his adultery. He makes no mention of all of the deception that he orchestrated and the lying and the betrayal to his nation? Why? Why does he not? Because in here, right in verse 12, we see the deepest possible ultimate root of why David sinned in the first place. And also why you and I sin in the first place. When we make the conscious choice that I'm going to indulge into this temptation rather than seeking to honor the Lord in this situation. Why is it? A lack of joy in God. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. True confession Desire, desires a restored joy in God. Here David understood that his sexual sin was only a symptom of a much larger disease. The things I mentioned earlier, cheating on your taxes, lying to your spouse, bitterness against a family member or co-worker, jealousy, gossip, slander, Pornography, idolatry, things we worship, usually alongside God. Throughout the Bible, idolatry was a major problem. Not that they said, all right, God, we're not going to have nothing to do with you. It's that we say, God, yeah, you can stay here, but I'm also going to worship something else. When Moses came down from, from Mount Sinai and he got down there, they were doing, preparing a feast for the Lord, but worshiping a golden calf. And so all of us, myself included, all of us right now, probably have a few things that we're trying to worship alongside God. And you find those things out by our response when they're taken away. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. There's an old Scottish writer, and he said this, the young man who rings the door at the brothel unconsciously is seeking God.
every decision to sin that we make is because we lack a joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have forgotten him. We have forgotten what he has done for us. And we have forgotten that in him, as Psalm 1611, is the fullness of life. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the beautiful thing about Christianity. That God has come to us to resurrect us, to save us, to remove our sin, our guilt. To remove the punishment that we deserve because God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God. Ultimately for this purpose that we would know and enjoy him. The Westminster Catechism of Faith Confession of faith, it says that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. He is not merely the man upstairs. He is the Lord with his hands opened wide for you and I to know him and to rejoice in him every single day. Even in the midst of the life's worst tragedies. It's actually usually in those things... It seems to be, in my own experience, uh, particularly one, took took a little bit of time that I have become to know God most personally. I have felt him most close in my own pain, in my own sorrow. We know Paul described the Christian life in 2 Corinthians as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. You were made... To enjoy the Lord. Not just to obey Him. But to follow Him. To be with Him. To be close to Him. To be near to Him. That is the beginning place for us. One, as becoming Christians. If you're here today and you're not a Christian. If you're today and you have been convicted thinking. You know, I thought I was a Christian. All my, and I can't tell you how many times I hear this story. Part, It's one of my stories. It's, or, oh, it's my story. And I've heard it from a lot of other people that I know who they grew up in church all their life. They were five years old. They went and they prayed a prayer to ask Jesus into their heart. Nothing ever changed. Their life was never changed. And then they had a profound moment when they were an adult or a teenager when God just wrecked their life and, and came in and, and they saw their sin, they confessed it, and their life changed. Not that they became perfect, but that they desired to know him more. They desired to, to read his word and to listen to him speak. They desired to be in a covenant community of believers following Jesus together. Maybe that's you this morning. And I want you to know that you were made to rejoice in the Lord all the days of your life. And he offers himself to you if you would come. That is the starting place for becoming a Christian. And it is also the starting for us in our sustaining Christian life. Rejoicing in the Lord. And so maybe you today need to call upon the Lord. And you need to cry with David. Maybe you have sinned like David did. Maybe you have done things that bad and you've yet to come to God. And maybe you haven't. Maybe it's been some of these other things that maybe are more hidden, that are more secret, that are more tolerable. Or maybe for whatever reason, you just lack the joy of your salvation. You can't really put a finger on it. But for whatever reason, you're there. Come to him and pray with David. Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. A willing spirit to know and to love and to seek you with all that I have for every day that I'm on this earth until you call me home. So verse 1 all the way to 12, we see this inward work. This inward, private transformation that God is to do in our hearts. And then we see the byproduct of that is an outward zeal. It's an outward transformation for our own communities. He says then, after, restore to me the joy of my salvation. He says, then I will teach transgressors, basically sinners, your ways and they will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. And then my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and then my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You would not be pleased with a burnt offering. But the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. 
A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and in burnt offerings and in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Personal revival precedes congregational revival. And if we desire to see God to pour out on his, his spirit upon us as a congregation, let us go home and lock the door and hide away into our closet and cry out to the Lord with our own sin we need to bring before him and confess that we need him. I will teach. I will sing aloud. I will, de- be, I will declare. I wonder... Could this be sometimes for some of us why we can't sing? I've had so many people over the course of my life tell me, well, I'm just not kind of a singing person. And I'm a terrible singer. This is why I married a a wonderful singer. To kind of balance, balance a little bit there. But singing is such a powerful expression of, of praise. If, 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 think about this. When we love something and enjoy something, we can't help but praise. That's our natural response, is it not? It's like a plant producing oxygen. It's like us breathing and producing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's that we praise what we enjoy. Whether that be your sports team, whether that be your, your best friend or your job, whether that be a recreational activity, We praise what we enjoy. And it's interesting that it takes the joy of our salvation to teach, to sing, and to proclaim the goodness of the Lord. There is an outward public renewal when people individually fall on their face before God, confessing sin and in desperation and humility call to Him. Asking God to show them once again that he is our joy and that he is our life. There is nothing more valuable that you and I could contribute to God's kingdom, to our own family, and to your local church here. Than your own personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the beauty of that. Is that that places every single person in this room at the same level. We are all at the same place. Broken, needy, desperate sinners who need the Lord. And it's when we are all together honest about that. And we seek the Lord in that and with that. And we go to him specifically about it. That he begins to transform us, and by transforming us, he transforms us here. He transforms our communities. I hope you're you're doing our 21 days of prayer. And Dustin explained last week that we specifically designed that 21 days of prayer to start with you. And as you continue on, you're going to see how it works your way out. Yesterday's, if you remember, we've been posting them also on Facebook at 7 at night. Yesterday's, if you remember, it's about praying for reconciliation with family members and friends. So you begin to see it working about Wednesday. It was about praying for the restoration of your joy in the Lord's salvation for you. And so it is. So it is here that personal revival precedes congregational revival. And so today, this morning, with all that we are, all our shame, all our regret, all our sin, all our hurt, all our pain, all our indifference, all our anxiety, all our depression, all our boredom, would we come to him with it? Let's not hide. Let's not pretend. And let's not begin to believe the lie that God expects something else for us to be before we come to him. Let us like the tax collector who was so humbled wouldn't even look up to heaven, stood at a distance, said, God, be merciful to me. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for you in an individual level, and that's my prayer for this church, is that we would wake up to see the glory, the beauty, 
the love, the grace, the mercy, the kindness, and the intimacy with Jesus Christ that is offered to us. And so maybe today, your cry is, God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Come to him. He says, come to me, all who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Maybe today is the day where you've realized that, you know what? You're not a Christian. You don't know him. And your life proves it. Your heart proves it. The offer is on the table for you as well. Do not neglect this opportunity for forgiveness, for transformation, and for joy. For joy like something you've never imagined. A joy that permeates through all of our life regardless of what we suffer, regardless of what's taken away from us, regardless of the things that we lose. A joy and a rest. A rest in the Lord. Let me pray. Father, would you help us? Lord, would you search us now? And would you reveal to us in these next few moments where there may be sin in our life that we need to confess? Lord, I pray also that there may be things, there may be trauma and hardships that we also need to bring before you. There may be former, former sins that we continue to struggle with because they just keep popping back into our memory. Would you help us and draw us near that we would come to you with them? Lord, I pray that right now in these next few moments that you would do something that will matter in eternity. Lord, that you would transform us and change us and draw us near and that we would come to you with all that we are. And that we would surrender all to you. Help us, O oh Lord. We are desperate. We need your help. We ask in Jesus' name. Just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made, and it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless world, no one could explain. How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath Bring you more than a song For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking. 
broken into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the Coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. Oh, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made, and it's all about you. It's all about you. Let's pray together. Father, we just come before you right now. God, in humility and desperation, knowing that whatever sin we carry with us, because of the blood that was shed upon the cross, is forgiven. Because of the empty tomb that Jesus Christ left behind. God, we are forever and eternally sealed. God, that you have poured out your love on us, God, in all of our wickedness and waywardness. God, and we pray in these days, God, that you would stir our hearts for the one thing that will last forever. God, for the one thing that matters more than everything else in our world, that is to know Christ and enjoy you forever. God, you've invited us to come, and Lord, we just thank you. God, that you looked upon our sin and you were not turned away, but God, that you came for us on a rescue mission. So Lord, we pray that you would revive us again. God, that you would stir our hearts create a greater dependence upon Jesus Christ than we've ever known before. God, we ask it that that be true of ourselves, our church. 
Lord, that your Holy Spirit would stir this up in the heart of millions of people around the world. God, that we would taste and see that you are good. We would be reminded that you are good. We would magnify your name. Lord, you would be glorified in our lives and through our praise. So, Lord, again, we thank you. Lord, we ask that you would continue to have your way with us. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. Well, let me just say thank you all for being here this morning. I'm so glad to see you all. Uh, David, thank you for the word, brother. It really, really means a lot. I love that per, uh, our personal confession is the ground zero for our, for our public, our corporate revival. That is, that there, it, can, it does not begin uh, beyond ourselves first, us being desperate enough as individuals, as Christians, uh, seeking the Lord. So thank you for that. I have a couple of announcements for this morning, a couple of things I want to share, and then uh, about, about what's happening maybe in the upcoming weeks, we hope, and, uh, and then uh, we'll pray and we'll will be dismissed. Man, it's good to see you all this morning. I look forward to this every week. I'm glad to see you guys. So, all right, a couple things we have going on. Number one, let me just say this. Um, let's not forget our offering. We have our baskets here. We have drop boxes. As you walk out, you can give on at freedomwhitepond.org forward slash give. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, it really does make a difference in the mission and the ministries that we, that we are doing. Uh, some of that I'll share here in just a moment um, also. But so our offering, thank you for that, your stewardship. Um, also, so we're looking at, we, we've had a lot of questions. I've gotten some texts over the past week about our Sunday morning Freedom Kids. I know some watching online or, 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 check, or wait, waiting to hear some news about that. What are we going to do in terms of when are we reopening that? Right now we're kind of keeping that kind of minimal uh, to, kind of, to kind of suppress some of the contact and that kind of thing. Um, uh, we're looking at the first week of February, resuming Sunday morning uh, kids classes and also Wednesday evening activities that would include our freedom students that would include our freedom kids on Wednesday nights and that would also include our Wednesday night Bible study uh, for our adults and so I'll give you more information next week we're hoping and praying that the first week of February we will begin to resume all of those things uh, and we'll do that safely as 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 we know that uh, or as you know that we, we 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 try to make sure we do also uh, really um, one last thing, or really two things. Uh, if you have not picked up a, a 2021 prayer guide, we still have these. It is not too late for you to jump in. In fact, you can start at day one. If you, if you're, if you're, if you weren't here, or you missed last, last week's, uh, service, uh, online or, or, or in person, um, we still have these. Uh, and, and we would love for you to take one of these, and you can begin and read uh, read through some of this, and and just jump in day one. If you want to jump in where the church is at, you can get on Facebook and follow along there too. Um, we post like, like David said, so we post it every day at 7 p.m. It gets it gets posted on what day we're on in, in scripture and what you're praying for. This is a I, I believe that God has led us to give you this because it's a helpful resource in your prayer life, and so we hope and trust that you would get one of these if you do if you want them. Uh, we've got we've got several more copies. We'd love to make sure you have one of those. And last thing is this: I, I, mean, I shared the news about Dan Lishan last week. Um, uh, this week uh, we have we have been allowed, uh, we have been uh, invited uh, to begin to bring food for Candy and Tony. Uh, and so, if you would like to make food as part of our, our benevolence towards them, um, Lana. Lana will, it will be out in Station 180. My dear wife, Haley, uh, will be out in Station 180 as well. I would encourage you to talk to those ladies, and they will, they will kind of organize what, who's bringing what on what day. I know they would appreciate it right now. Um, there are no updates on, on, on what's going to happen with his celebration of life service, given the circumstances. But, but uh, anyway, uh, if you would like to serve them in that way and provide a meal, uh, for them, uh, more of those details you can find out in the out in the coffee shop here in just a few minutes. So, thank you all for being here. Uh, let me invite you to stand with me. We're going to pray, and uh, we'll sing and we'll be dismissed this morning. Father, we come again to you, Lord. God, and we're so incredibly grateful 
Lord, we're grateful for your sovereign power, your steadfast love. God, the salvation that we have received in in our Savior, Jesus Christ. God, a salvation that produces a hope that this world does not know. It produces a kind of joy this world does not know, a kind of love and satisfaction this world does not know. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would be reminded and we would continually look to you every day, God, that we would, we would be encouraged, God, that we would become so desperate that we would see that you are what we first and foremost need above everything and everyone else. God, and that we would be reminded that if we have you, we have more than enough of what we need. So, Lord, we just, we just come to you, God, and we, are so, we just say thank you. God, and I pray, Lord, this week as we go back to our workplaces, Lord, as we spend time with our families, as we're at school, as we're out in our communities, as we're recreating or whatever it is we're doing, Lord, that we would, we would know that your face is shining upon, your, upon us. God, you've given us peace God, that you would bless us and keep us in every area of our walk of life. God, that everything we would do would bring glory and honor to Jesus. God, that the world would know that light has come into the world and the darkness has not overcome it. God, that you are, that your kingdom, your message, your salvation, God, is continuing to march on to the ends of the earth, Lord. And I pray that that people would see it in us, in our lives the joy of our salvation. So God, restore it to us, the joy of our salvation. May we humbly confess and repent of our sin. God, and may we be, may we experience the kind of freedom, God, that you have set us free for, to enjoy. Lord, and we ask that, that you would do that for us this very day and the days ahead. And we ask it all in in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus you are the Spirit. 